record. All right, we are now recording for posterity. Um, so to check with folks, uh, if you are in fact seeing my screen with uh, InfoViz rules of thumb, could you hit the check button? The check button, yes. Okay, great. Confirming that I'm showing the right screen. Uh, as from before, uh, if you've got questions, go ahead and do a hand raise. Um, and let me also open up the group chat since a lot of you used that last time as well. Uh, and I will get that off the main screen also. Okay, so far I see no comments in the chat. Uh, all right, so I hope we're all staying safe uh, in these times. And uh, although the uh, plan for today is to do rules of thumb, we are first going to actually switch over to, uh, wait, uh, right. Uh, so the first things to notice is that um, from last time, what I've posted is both uh, my local and the YouTube version of these videos streaming. Uh, so these are all going to be recorded so you can see them uh, later on if you so choose. Uh, I see we've got about 42 people on today, so quite a lot of you are seeing them live. Um, all right, so last time we got uh, near the end, but not quite to the end. And there we go, aggregate two. Also, let me mention, um, I decided it was a bit confusing to have all of the slides together in one full slide deck. Um, although on many other days, I have uh, had just updated the slides with the second pass, like color one versus color two. Um, I've actually split aggregate one and aggregate two into two different slide decks, uh, just so that everyone would be sure to see that I had a lot of the um, announcements near the beginning for the aggregate two slide deck with our new world order of um, going with Zoom. So uh, those have been split. That's different than what you saw last time. Uh, so the place we got to at the end of last time was we made it through dimensionality reduction, but we did not yet talk about uh, embedding. So let's take a few minutes to talk about that today. Um, so what do I mean by embedding? Uh, the idea with that is that we have combined information within one view. Uh, this is often called focus plus context, as you might guess, to focus on one thing and yet have the context surrounding you. Um, hold on one sec. Let me make sure I'm actually getting... Uh, how is it that I heard somebody else talking? I thought I had muted all. Um, all right, uh, please do do hand raise uh, if you have any questions. I believe the person that just talked did not talk on purpose. Um, and uh, and also to check, are you guys seeing um, me on the side of the screen along with the slides for most of the screen? Is that is in fact what's happening? Okay, great. Um, and let's see, chat comments there, yes. Okay, uh, it's just a little hard for me to see what Zoom is doing. It's being quite cryptic. Um, okay, so back to how is it <laughs> the part where I'm not seeing my mouse is making this quite hard to understand what's going on all right I will somehow try to continue on uh, without a cursor um, <sighs> where <laughs> where I, I really do need to find my mouse okay um, that is hopefully a bit better. Okay, back to where we are, uh, sorry for the delay. So combining information in a single view, um, there's a few different ways to do this uh, so-called focus plus context. And one is to el what's called allied data, a lesion, it's just the big word for leaving things out. Um, and so typically with, um, 
Elysian views, what we're doing is we're doing a mixture of filtering and aggregating. Um, so, and we'll walk through a few examples of that. Um, another very common approach is to superimpose a, a layer where we've actually got some sort of a local lens view um, or distorting geometry. Um, and so there's some different design choices for that kind of distortion. You could have like a radial fisheye lens or rectilinear. Uh, you might have one regions of distortion or many. You could do that locally or globally. Um, so let's actually look at some examples of these. Uh, I see a raised hand and let me unmute you. Yep. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I was just wondering if, um, you know those weather charts where they uh, plot precipitation and temperature in the same one, and one's a bar chart and the other's a line chart? Would that be considered a superimposition? Um, I don't think I exactly have the, uh, from your description quite possibly, although I don't have a mental image of what you have in mind. Um, okay, but they're pretty you, you could like look at, I'm sure they are, but I just, uh, you could find an example and stick a URL to that in the chat, uh, and then I could bring that up. Um, okay, we'll do. Because I have no mental picture. Okay, so once that's done, uh, speak up and we'll go back to that. Um, okay. so, um, in the meantime, let's look at some examples, uh, of a lesion. So one is this idea, this is a, a DOI stands for degree of interest. Here is a particular example that's similar to one I showed you way, way, way back in the beginning with space tree, um, th which is a variant of that. So in this one, they're actually showing all, um, information. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very large, this actually got hundreds of thousands of nodes in this ontology, which is basically trying to, you know, look through a hierarchical structure of a way to organize all information in the world. Um, and uh, one of the things we're seeing here is that they've actually, they're going from right to left, uh, and they're going down through Hebrew, where we're seeing a mix of Hebrew and Arabic with this left to right, right to left ordering. The part I want you to notice is not so much the content um, of this particular visualization, but the form. What they've done is instead of showing hundreds of thousands of things, you select one and then it expands out only that one. You select the next, you see only that. And the key thing is that all of the things that are not expanded out are just being shown with these little aggregate views, these triangles uh, that are showing you how uh, large the elided sections are, the, the left out sections. So this is a relatively straightforward example of dynamic aggregation of the parts that haven't been expanded. And then you're showing the expanded parts in detail. Um, so this sort of elision in some ways is the most straightforward thing to understand. Aggregating what you're not seeing and then um, expanding out the parts you are seeing. We've, some, we've seen some other views like that. Let's take a look at some of the alternatives to that. Um, and one is this uh, metaphor of a fisheye lens where people are actually distorting the geometry. Um, you can see an example of, uh, yes, I see another raised hand. So before I move on, let's take a look at that. Uh, Ethan, you're unmuted. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> so, um, for the previous example, if they didn't have those triangles, would that not have ag would that not be considered like aggregation, or is it like or um, is aggregation just like the I guess the title or the key? Um, if they didn't have these little uh, triangles at all, then we might consider it just filtering that we'd filtered out everything that hadn't been selected. Part of what makes, with these sort of focus plus context approaches, they all tend to be a mixture of interaction and of visual encoding. So by clicking on something, you then saw things expand and then dynamically it was automatically computing the size, the, these little aggregation triangles. Um, right. So it, it's that your interaction triggers this combined action is typically the hallmark. I'm not sure if I exactly answered your question. Will you ask it again? 
Yeah. So is the aggregation due to the fact that the triangles showcase how big those, uh, like kind of how much it expands, or is it just the fact that it expands overall and that it can consolidate into that, like that small key? So if Got we it. didn't have those visual tri triangles, is it still aggregating? Um, it's definitely the case that the size of those triangles is showing the size of the thing that they're aggregating. So let's say that that's what makes it useful aggregation as opposed to almost useless aggregation. If you just had a uniform size triangle, I mean, I guess you could call it aggregation, but perhaps not very well done aggregation because it wouldn't give you any of that idea of the information sent about what's, what would happen if you de-aggregated it. Um, so, so let's just say that useful aggregation is, is when you're sizing those according to the data underneath. Right, but um, so is the like is is it not saying that like all these things are aggregated into Hebrew or all these things are aggregated into Farsi, like regardless of the size of the triangle, is that still not considered aggregation if it's all falling onto the same topic or same language? I don't think I understood your question. Ask that again. Um, I guess like. What do you mean like aggregated how, into Hebrew? I I guess I'm not. So if you look at the if you look at like the rightmost column, I think it's the rightmost, or if it's oh sorry not the most right, but the second the second most right, right column, yeah, with Hebrew, Farsi, and Arabic, and all three of those have been selected. Exactly. So like, um, notice how like they don't have triangles. Um, right. Or, exactly, because they're not aggregated. They're actually shown in detail. Oh right. Okay. So okay. so what so that's showing is if Hebrew were aggregated, all you would see would be like you see how right above Hebrew is Greek and. All you see right. there, it has not been expanded out. So the expanded guys are not aggregated. It's only the contracted, unexpanded ones that are aggregated. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, in the meantime, I now have a link from Ian that's showing me what the question is about. Oh, that's definitely superimposed. Yes. Uh, so that's a line chart superimposed on top of a bar chart. Um, but it, it is possible to have two things superimposed on each other and not have them be focus plus context necessarily. Uh, focus plus context is a, a particular approach. So I think we're about to get to an example of that. Um, let me try to go back to the slides. Um, so uh, let, me, let me wait on that until we get to a superimposed example. Um, Back to this idea of a fisheye lens, uh, the idea here is people are deliberately choosing to distort things that are underneath the center of the lens uh, by having those large and then things get smaller and smaller as you fall off to the outside of the lens, sort of like a little uh, draggable fisheye or magnifying glass. So let's think about what's going on here. It's actually these, both of these examples are a radial, so we've got a, a radial effect rather than a rectilinear one. Um, we're seeing a single one as opposed to multiple. Uh, it's a, got a local extent rather than a global one. Um, and so let's, here are two examples. One is um, a, uh, a matrix view, the other is a scatter plot. Um, let's actually go and look at an interactive example of this in D3, because that's going to be the most uh, crucial one um, for normal usage. Let me actually get this. Uh, view to be the whole screen. So the thing to notice here, see how as I move my mouse around, what's underneath it looks big. Um, and so, you know, this, in some ways, this feels a lot like if you in the real world had a magnifying glass, uh, you would be seeing that. Now, one of the things to, and so here's another example where it's, it's not actually showing information, it's just showing you the grid underneath so you can get some sense of what this magnifying uh, this this fisheye lens is doing. Um, notice how there are other kinds of distortion possible. Here's one that's more rectilinear. So here then is an interactive example in wah, it gets a little. Now notice how it can be really quite disorienting to see this. Um, not only is it the, the interaction been tuned to be a bit hair trigger, but things are moving around a lot. Uh, so, you know, the good thing is we can start to see what's going on in a region of the scatter plot that might have been uh, much more occluded. Like in here, we can actually start breaking these out. Uh, I see your hand, Mohit. I'll answer in one sec. Um, now, notice also that one of the things that's going on here is there is a grid in back to give us some visual indication of what's actually 
happening in this view. Uh, without that grid, it would be even more disorienting of, of what's going on. Uh, all right, hand raised for a question. You are, wait, that's not, yes, you are unmuted. Um, I was just wondering on these slides, um, whenever you're finished with this example, I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit about what that chart actually represents, the percentage VU on either side of the axis. Which chart? Uh, the one on the slides. Um, the one on the previous slide. Yeah, that one. Ah, this one. Um, oh, I'm trying to, I believe it's this one. Let's take a look. Uh, it was something about poker. Oh no, that's the other one. Um, so hold on, maybe it's this. Um, right. Uh, I believe that percent, if I remember correctly, the percent show uh, is about the percentage of people that show their hands versus flop. This is some sort of comparison of professional poker players, I believe. Um, I was hoping that this one might actually give a little more information about it. Let's see if on the page that this came from, uh, alas, no, I think I, I don't actually know that there's gonna be any further information in that. Um, let me check one more thing. I, I, so I think the short answer is, um, just checking whether in the book I actually said what these were. Is this an example from the book? Um, uh, all I said was poker player data set with scatter plot showing correlation between two strategies. So I believe these are, uh, and then the matrix view was correlation between a specific complex strategy and the player's winning rate encoded by color for that, no, that's not it, um, for that other one. Um, yeah, so all right. I don't know enough about poker to answer your question in any more detail, um, but uh, the part I want people to be thinking about with this is uh, the pros and cons of this kind of an approach. Um, you know, the pro is that you can actually, for example, read these labels, which we couldn't do before. Um, so without this fisheye lens, notice how in all these other regions, the labels are too small to be seen. You actually can uh, inspect and read the labels in this. So similarly for the one on the left here, where we've got this uh, matrix view, where we've got only a few pixels on each side for the small squares, in the region where the fisheye lens is, though, we're actually able, again, these uh, are names of specific poker players in the online system, I believe. Um, so, right, so I think you, you got some sense of that interactively. Um, in a system like D3, uh, there's actually some capability for that uh, that is um, more possible than if you were using, say, you know, some other system where you weren't able to actually program things on the fly. Um, let's actually, I just want to go briefly back to, where are we here? Um, right, so there's just directly a plugin in D3 that supports this kind of distortion, um, where it is, let me make these a bit larger, uh, where it's actually using the, the D3 scale um, stuff, but this kind of movement, notice how this is starting to change what the scatter plots for. Remember that scatter plots are all about encoding um, directly in 2D with horizontal vertical spatial positions, something meaningful. The fact that this moves around so much as we interact means that some of that power of things like spatial memory of remembering where things are, it can be actually quite disorienting. Um, so things are not nearly so bad with this example, which is a little bit less extreme. The scale of the data is a lot smaller. Uh, so the amount of distortion is less. Um, uh, with this one, the amount of the distortion is, is significant. 
Um, Here's a different example. Uh, this is actually some stuff we did in my own group uh, a while back where it's an example of a rectilinear distortion. Uh, in this picture down on the uh, left, uh, what we see is the same tree um, where everything is uniformly spaced versus uh, where, again, I really wish I could get my cursor back and I don't know why it's gone. Oh well. Uh, let me just briefly yeah why <laughs> why has zoom taken my cursor that is not helpful um uh i can use a pointer if i'm sharing your screen uh that was some zoom advice that i'm trying to parse I can use a pointer, meaning I mean, I've been sharing my screen quite a bit where I just kept the normal mouse pointer, so I'm not sure what. Ah, last time I didn't full screen. That, thank you. That is what I'm doing differently. I full screened, which is a path for disaster. OK, let me leave it in this non full screen mode because it's going to be a lot easier for me to see what I'm doing. Thank you. Um, Yes, look, I have the mouse back. So, uh, so on the left, we've got uniformly spaced nodes. On the right, uh, we've actually got uh, part of that region has been um, drawn out to be larger. Um, and so with that kind of what's uh, this technique called stretch and switch navigation, some of this is larger and others are smaller. Um, so with this, it's a rectilinear kind of a focus rather than a radial one. Um, it's possible to actually have multiple foci, although now that I look, uh, I, that's not actually being demonstrated here. Um, it's got a global rather than local impact. Instead of just being one region that's being distorted, notice how when this part gets larger, everything else has gotten smaller. Um, so I think what I'll actually do here is show an example of a video, which you typically do need to see to understand how these things play in action. Uh, what's the fastest way to get to that video? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, I believe it will be, since this is from our own group. Oh, also while I'm up here, the thing I want you guys to notice, uh, I'm gonna play a research video, but also I've made a new uh, playlist on my own YouTube page for all the 436V videos, which I will put there. But in the meantime, let me find, uh, I see a raised hand, which I'll get to in one sec. Where is the tree juxtaposer video? Um, how is it that I am unable to see the video I'm looking for? Um, Maybe I go to here. Yes, here we go. Uh, before I play this, let me check if there was a quick question. Um, somebody had raised a hand. If you unraise your hand, then you are no longer at the top of the list. So please re-raise your hand so I can unmute you. Was it Ian? If you could re-raise your hand, or if your question has gone away. Um, oh, that's just about the keynote preferences slideshow interacting. Um, you're saying if I go here, preferences slideshow, Aha, thank you. I think that's exactly what I needed. Um, let's try that. Oh my God, you've just improved my life. Thank you, Ian. Um, much, much better. So, uh, but in fact, what I was about to do is uh, show video. No, 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 no. Bad internet. Okay, today is the day of the internet melting down. Um, 
Fine. Uh, uh, this is not quite as smooth as I had planned, but let's see if this works, even as I wonder why QuickTime feels the need to convert this video. Um, come on, QuickTime, you can do it. You can do it. We do not need color bars. Um, all right, let's actually have a look starting around here. Good God. Um, that audio track got mangled. Uh, so, The part that I wanted to actually show you, and maybe I'll just scrub through this manually, is that in, notice how as the, um, I'm gonna make sure that this audio is down and just play. Um, so as parts of this are dragged out, there's this stretch and squish navigation. Um, this is a large enough tree. So this is a tree of um, all known species, well, not all known species, but, uh, at least um, many hundreds of thousands uh, of species in the tree of life uh, with their Latin names. Uh, and the thing to notice is that when one region is made larger, the others are made smaller. Uh, also the idea about multiple foci, you're seeing here that there have been multiple focus points rather than just a single fisheye lens. Uh, there's a lot going on here in terms of uh, the graphics infrastructure under the hood to actually make this uh, be able to render in real time even with large data sets when you want um, small regions to actually stay marked. Um, but this gives you some sense of what that interaction feels like. Um, I think in a moment, maybe because it's worth mentioning, we will see interactions between um, linked interactions where when you move in one, you will also see it move in the other. Let's see if that's true. Uh, this is actually showing linked highlighting between, this might be a useful example of how it is that what is together in one view might be together in the other view as we're seeing so far for the green plants and for the animals. But here's an example somewhere in, um, if I knew more Latin, I would remember what these are. I think this might be, Ascomycota might be fungi. Uh, but the point is that the, the subtree on one side is actually disparate on the other side. That's showing you relationships between these two trees. And this is an example of how linked highlighting at scale is actually showing you things. Um, and then this is just an example showing in a, a large high res display um, how it is that even if you've got a situation where you're not able to actually render everything all at once, and this is gonna come to a point we're gonna be making later on, um, that even having a gradual interaction where as you move the mouse, things change, and then the rest fills in as it's able, is a way to have a guaranteed frame rate with rendering so you have responsiveness, even though you're not able to actually render, in this case, it's trees with millions of nodes um, uh, side by side uh, in real time. Okay, I think that's enough tree juxtaposer for now. Uh, let's go back to the slides uh, armed with my pointer. Um, Uh, yes, I will add the YouTube URL um, to the slides at the uh, end of today's lecture. Um, so let's talk about some of the costs and benefits of using this kind of distortion. Let's look at some alternatives. Um, so here you're seeing three different approaches to trying to show structure in the middle of a complex and occluded graph. Um, and 
this idea that you've carefully chosen geometric distortion, um, it's used quite a lot on network data sets rather than table data sets, in part because as we saw, it was quite disorienting to have the scatter plot have things jumping around, given that the entire premise of visual encoding with a scatter plot is that we're actually using spatial position to mean something. In a lot of node link graphs, now remember that spatial position is not necessarily directly encoding information. What we're doing is we're using the topological structure, the nodes connected by the links. It's those connections that show you something. And that topological connection is something you can still see, even if you've got some amount of carefully chosen geometric, geometric distortion. So on the top left here, um, we've got the fisheye lens. So some of the things that are good about it is that we're able to see things in the middle large. Um, some of the things that are not so good about it is that as we get towards the edges of the fisheye, we're actually seeing things more compressed. It's a local effect, so the things that are completely outside that local region are not affected at all. Let's compare this to just a straight up magnifying lens. What if you just treated this like it were a magnifying glass? Um, in many ways, it's less dis disorienting. Uh, what's directly inside the magnifying glass, you're able to see large. You don't quite get that um, uh, effect around the outside where maybe things go from large to compressed to normal size. Uh, on the other hand, you've got occlusion. You've taken a very small region and you've blown it up to being big. So everything besides the tiny region that's now large is just completely occluded. You can't see it at all. So this question of what's the local neighborhood around that area that's been chosen, that's what you don't have. That's the difference between this sort of magnifying lens approach uh, where you really do have a front layer that's large occluding the back layer and a fisheye lens like this where you are able to see contextual information around the focus region, um, although it is at this point quite distorted. Um, and so you don't have that same occlusion problem that you have with the magnifying lens. Um, so certainly if what you need to do involves a straight up length comparison, then probably this sort of geometric distortion is not going to be a great idea. With networks in general, um, understanding topological structure is not necessarily impaired by this kind of distortion, uh, both the connection and the containment. Um, I see a question here on the chat. Is fish eye a form of overview detail? Um, this sh so by overview detail, we typically mean that there are two separate windows and all of these focus plus context approaches, these embedding approaches are trying to get some of the benefits of overview and detail, but instead of having them be in separate windows, it's trying to smush them together into the same window. Um, so you can think of fisheye and overview detail as two alternatives, but they are different alternatives. In one, you're combining it all in one window. In one, by overview detail, we mean you have a separate window. Is that clear? Um, so another issue with the distortion, which is actually something that we saw a bit of in that um, D3 display with the grids is, if you already know the original structure, then it's easier to understand how and what is being distorted. If you don't know that structure at all, it might not be clear that you're even doing a geometric distortion. Uh, that's one reason why it's very common to have things like grids in the background to try to show that a little more explicitly. So it can be confusing or even misleading about the fact that distortion is happening. Um, usually what happens is if it's an, these are typically things that are done interactively. Um, so you are moving the mouse, you are seeing things change as you move the mouse. So in that sense, you won't be surprised that it's happening at all, but it still might be difficult to understand what's going on with that structure. Um, and it could be difficult to actually keep track of, well, what are the objects in each view? So let's look at a couple of alternatives. Here are um, a few maybe not quite so obvious approaches of different ways to do this that aren't using the idea of a lens quite in either one. Um, so here's an approach. Uh, they call that uh, neighboring layering in the research paper. What I want you to notice is the, um, 
what they've done is they've put the mouse over one node in particular and then they are showing the one hop neighborhood. So this is sort of an alternative. We saw some previous things with uh, networks and dynamic layering where we put the, the cursor over a node and then it just lit up um, all of the other ones. That worked reasonably well when we had a fairly uniform um, background color and then we say lit up everything in, um, let me actually quickly uh, jump to that and show you that example. Uh, that was in, probably interact. Uh, and yeah, like this was the example I wanted to show where um, so in this case, they weren't even, this is a, a D3 block for a geographic view where they weren't even drawing the nodes until you were directly over it with the mouse. Um, the other one was, uh, was this also one where we weren't drawing the links until, okay, yeah, this is another one where the links weren't even being drawn uh, until there was an explicit click. Um, the, uh, in contrast, what they're doing here is they're essentially creating a new visual layer where there's a foreground which is the one hop neighbors of these. And notice how these are already color coded links. So it, you would lose the ability to see what colors the links were if you simply colored everything that was a one hop neighbor with a new color. This is often a problem when you're doing selection and highlighting. If you simply use a changing color as your highlight, um, for one thing, it obliterates the colors you had. For another thing, given how much these are using highly saturated colors already, it might not, not even be visually obvious uh, which were the ones that were supposed to be emphasized. So what they've done here is they basically created a semi-transparent, um, semi-opaque background layer, which is exactly sized to be um, the region of all the one-hop connective neighbors in the topological graph. Um, and so they've created a way that it de-emphasizes what's in the back, but it doesn't completely occlude it. Notice the difference between the neighborhood layering and the magnifying lens. The magnifying lens is opaque. You can't see anything that's underneath it. Whereas with neighborhood layering, we're actually seeing um, uh, uh, some amount of the background uh, through this translucent layer. Um, but we are really able to pick out what's going on with the neighbors. Notice how it's a lot easier to actually keep track of what the one-hop neighbors are with neighborhood layering than with that fisheye lens view. Um, here's another approach. Uh, this is a more dynamic technique. In this one, notice how we're zoomed much further in. The user has still put their mouse over one node, this node in the middle, and with all the one-hop neighbors, instead of being drawn in their original positions zoomed out as they are with neighboring neighborhood layering, this uh, so-called bring and go technique treats all of these edges like springs, brings all of these nodes in towards the selected one. So it's a dynamic change of the nodes, but what's preserved is the orientation. So this yellow one, for example, might've been much further out there. It's been brought towards the center. So you get some sense of where they were, or at least the direction that they originally could be found in. So it gives you some global orientation of where they are in the graph, but because it's dynamically bringing them in, um, then you're actually able to be zoomed in enough that you have some hope of reading the labels. Maybe not from this view, because we're only seeing this on a tiny part of the screen, but if this were in the entire screen, you would actually have a hope of seeing them at the level to read the, the, the um, the labels, then when you move the mouse away from that one and br brought them back, they would spring back to their positions. So this is definitely one where you've got an animated transition from going from the original positions in and then back outward. So it's a dynamic approach. So the idea is that once we get into these more sophisticated uses of interaction and focus plus context, there are alternatives. Um, and a lot of these are intrinsically uh, having interaction and rendering uh, or, or layout be um, hand in hand with each other. Um, so there was a time when focus plus context was quite popular. 
Uh, it's arguably somewhat less popular today, in part because there have been some studies on just how disorienting it can be to do this sort of geometric distortion. Uh, so there is, people are often trying to be very uh, careful about how much distortion is uh, disorienting versus not. And these kinds of other approaches where you're still seeing focus and context, but not necessarily using something quite as heavy handed as just a fisheye lens uh, are getting to be more popular. Okay, so that gets us to the end of the um, focus plus context material. So again, embedding is when you are combining things together in one view, as opposed to overview plus detail, where you have multiple views, uh, but they are both strategies for this problem. Um, and let's actually see, do I have, I think I've got this other slide deck here, the specific problem of um, how it is that we handle complexity, because both overview and detail, which is a form of faceting, and um, embedding, which is a form of reducing, these are both alternatives to simply having a single view that changes over time, where what you have to do is remember things. So we've got this set of options of how we try to deal with complexity. And this is all for these contexts where we've got a lot more information than we can just see in a single static view. So these are all attempts to deal with scale. All right. Um, so what we're going to go to now is um, new stuff, checking for questions. Nope. Um, all right. So uh, we do still have milestone two coming up next week. Um, so this section is called rules of thumb. And what I want people to think about with these rules of thumb is not that these are absolute set in stone guidelines that are true no matter what. These are some things that are worth thinking about um, explicitly because there are some known issues and trade-offs. So uh, I've got a number of them, th about 3D, 2D, eyes beat memory, resolution over immersion, overviews, responsiveness, which we've already talked about, but I just wanted to remind you of it briefly, and then form and function. So let's start with 3D. Here are some graphs. These are not graphs that should make you happy. These are visualizations where 3D is being used in a way that is simply not well thought out. Uh, so let's call this the unjustified use of 3D. Um, it's a great site, uh, wtfviz.com, um, that uh, is fantastic for bad examples. Uh, so here's two that I found in a relatively small amount of searching under under five minutes on this site um, that are truly terrible examples of 3D. And let's try to walk through and understand why. Um, does anyone want to either raise hands or in the chat window note something that's just crazy about these graphs? What, what is dubious here? Any thoughts? <laughs> How dare they use a pie chart? True, but they, they did not stop at pie chart. What have they done with these poor pie charts? 3D pie charts overlapping the shapes. Um, right, so, so this thing where we're overlapping the shapes here with both the triangles actually and these 3D pie charts. Um, you know, why is the orientation so random? You know, why, why is triangle charts even a thing? So you guys have seen bar charts, right? Where you had a line mark of uniform width. In a triangle chart, you do not have a uniform width anymore. You, they're trying to length code. Um, so basically, but they're also trying to uh, width code. So we already saw some of the challenges of combined width and um, height coding, even just with 2D area. But this is even worse. It's 3D volume. We are incredibly bad at, um, under, at making perceptual judgments about 3D volumes. Um, and what else have we got? Um, yeah, so you guys already mentioned, oh, no, back, back, uh, the random orientation, but yes, they are in fact showing the same chart multiple times for no apparent reason. Um, 
And uh, so yes, they are they are all pie charts. So let's also think about what they're doing. Their color coding isn't necessarily uh, as awful as we could think. We could think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they're trying to show seven categories. That's not crazy per se. Uh, they didn't pick incredibly discriminable colors. They have these two greens that are pretty pretty close to each other, and this sort of orange magenta purple is maybe not as distributed as they could be. Um, but their, their true sin here is not their use of color, it, it's their use of 3D. So we are, in fact, notice how this blue triangle in front is blocking some of what's going on behind it. Um, the fact that they're semi-transparent isn't actually helping things so much. Um, and, uh, and, and what's going on here with these 3D pie charts, the fact that we've got this strange orientation means, well, it just seems to be harder to actually read off the relative size of these pie chart sectors. So although angle is not as good as length for um, reading values, we're actually not terrible at it. So there is a reason why sometimes people do use um, angle in certain contexts, even in pie charts. But with these 3D pie charts where we've got this off axis viewpoint, it's now getting extremely hard to actually read off those angles. So it would be a short class today if I just said, don't do this. But let's take a longer amount of time to actually talk through, well, what do I mean by this? What, what exactly should we not do? What is going on here? Why, why is this making our eyes explode? Um, so a key thing to notice, is we've been talking a lot about spatial position in this class. When I say spatial position, what I actually mean is planar spatial position. So in planar spatial position, we've got in one, so we have horizontal, we have vertical spatial position. This means using computer graphics words in an axis aligned plane that is perpendicular to the viewing frustum. That is something that we're actually seeing flat on, not something that we're seeing tilted. Once we're actually trying to make judgments about how far into the scene is something, a three-dimensional depth position, we're not nearly so good at it. We're actually worse than angle, we're worse than area. So the ability to see depth into the world, um, it, we are not nearly as able to make perceptual judgments about that as we are about planar spatial position, which is what we've been talking about. So remembering that um, psychophysical power law, remember the idea that all of our responses to perceptual phenomena that we're getting through our senses uh, are describable through a power law. What changes is the exponent on that power law and the exponent for length is one, meaning we're actually getting very good ability to um, discriminate there. But depth is actually a bit worse than area um, in terms of our ability to actually even just discriminate this as a uh, perceptual stimulus. So position, when I use that in this context in class, I don't mean, I mean 2D spatial position. I don't mean 3D depth. Now, why is this? Because after all, we are three-dimensional beings. We don't live in flatland. Um, or do we? So let's think about what happens in the world about how we see. So you might think, you know, here I am, we're in three dimensional space. Um, what's actually going on? And I'm gonna go out of uh, display mode just so I can see my picture for a sec here. Um, so when we are looking at things in 3D, I have to see my, where my hands are with respect to my face. What we're seeing is when, when we look straight out, um, you can think of there as being an image plane. If you, and, and what we're seeing is in the image plane, when we look out there, we can very easily move our eyes quickly back and forth. And so we can see information going off in this direction, in this direction, in this direction. So we can acquire information about this. Think of it as being a two-dimensional image plane. In this case, it's handy that I'm on video because literally there is an image plane in which you, know, you can see what I'm seeing going out here. Um, so, but now think about what happens if you try to just go along one of these rays into the scene. So if we go along, let me actually point towards the camera. Uh, if we go along one of these rays, then 
we don't, if there's something here and then there's something back there, we're not, one is occluding the other, right? So now you're not able to see my, let's see what, it, you can't see my hand because the cell phone's in the way. For me, it's the other way around, right? I can't see, if I'm looking straight through here, I can't see my cell phone because my hand's in the way. So this idea that you are, in some sense, you're not even seeing in two and a half dimensions, Colin Ware, uh, a perceptual oriented visualization guy, had this great coinage saying we see in 2.05 dimensional space. So you can very quickly acquire information on the image plane from your eyes moving, but in order to actually see things that are occlusion relationships where one thing's in front of the other, you literally have to actually move your viewpoint. Um, so we have to move our head or we actually have to get up and walk, right? If I get up and walk around, now I can see things that used to be hidden back behind my monitor that I'm looking at right now. So what's called motion parallax is that I can see things just from uh, head motion parallax from moving my head, uh, or I might actually have to move my body to see things that are occluded. So you can think of the fact that you're really only seeing the shell of the world. That's what this diagram is trying to get at. So even though you can see a lot of information, if you just thought about like the pixel density of what you're seeing, you, if, by just looking up and down and left to right, you can acquire a lot of information, but you're only getting one point along a ray from your eye to the first thing that's in the scene that includes it. So I can't see behind my display. Um, of course, we can do things like, well, we can rotate our view. Let's go back to our obligatory cat picture, right? So we can see this cat. Of course, if my hand's in front of it, that is now blocking uh, the face of the cat who is now woken up and wondering what we're doing. Um, so this question of as long as there's nothing in between a viewpoint and some object in the scene, sorry, cat, um, then we can see, but we can occlude that. So occlusion. Uh, blocking of things behind other things is a fundamental problem, uh, as I just saw by blocking your view with my hand there, a uh, fundamental problem in the 3D world that we live in. So now what can you do in the face of occlusion? Well, for one thing, you can move things around, right? If one thing is, a if, if I'm trying to see something and there's something in the way of it, well, you know, I could move my viewpoint to try to see what's going on. So you can, you can move things. There is this idea of interaction. And so that can resolve occlusion re relationships. I might look at this phone and try to say, well, what's happening with this side or with that side? I could spin it around. So you can resolve occlusion with interaction if you've got any kind of a navigational control, but it takes time and it takes actual cognitive load. It, you have to remember what you saw before and then compare that to the memory, uh, that memory to what you're seeing now. So some occlusion relationship, right? Let's, okay, yes, this mug has nothing in it. So you can start to have um, motion to resolve this occlusion relationship, but it takes time. Here is an example on the screen of um, a 3D graph uh, where they're actually, in fact, using a 3D fisheye view and you can spin things around to try to resolve some of those occlusion relationships. So occlusion is one of the big sins. What about perspective distortion? So many people might think that perspective distortion, if you read any sort of art history book, it was one of the crowning achievements of the Renaissance that people actually learned how um, to make realistic looking pictures because they figured out the mathematics of the fact that things get smaller as they're further away from you. Um, and if you take a computer graphics class, you'll hear a lot about how to actually do the perspective transformation in order to make pictures that are physically realistic, where big stuff, stuff that's near you is big, stuff that is distant is smaller. The problem is that although that's great for computer graphics and painting, it's terrible for a visualization context. If you're trying to have anything that's encoded by size, perspective distortion completely messes that up because suddenly the size coding isn't uniform. In planar spatial position without 3D, you can actually directly compare sizes. And of course, if they're aligned, you can even more precisely compare them. But let's look at this view. This is actually, it's in a very old system because people were enthusiastic in the early 90s about this kind of thing, but not so much anymore, um, where they actually were encoding these things as little monoliths, as little three-dimensional blocks, and then they were arranging them into the screen with depth. You can't compare these heights at all. Not from a per you can't directly compare, say, this height to that height, because who knows? Is it 
actually, like how much smaller is it? You, you can't grab exactly that number of pixels on screen compared to that because those pixels mean different things now once we're using 3D perspective distortion. So this whole planar power of spatial position that we really emphasized um, in these charts here about the channels where position was at the top, we've just blown that away. We've just made ourselves unable to use that power of high precision comparison. So occlusion is a problem of things blocking each other. Perspective is distortion is a problem of things being different sizes depending on how far away they are. Um, so, you know, bringing us back to things like 3D pie charts and 3D bar charts, uh, you know, one of the big problems with this 3D pie chart here was our ability to actually judge that angle was affected by the perspective distortion. Um, the, you know, um, the, the amount of pink we can see is sort of different depending on what, you know, that's a very um, tilted back into the screen view of this pie chart here. And we get a different sense of the proportions between the pink part and the blue part maybe than we do with this one, where it's at least a little bit easier to see. So I have never in my life actually seen a good reason to have a 3D pie chart. Similarly, it's typically quite hard to justify 3D bar charts because um, they suffer from these same problems of both perspective distortion and occlusion. Here's a nice example from Stephen Few um, where, well, what have we got here? We've got a 3D bar chart. So notice how that little teeny red block there is incredibly hard to see because it's hidden mostly behind these blue bars. Um, so we definitely have this problem of occlusion. Uh, Perspective distortion means it's actually hard to compare the heights, right? So like this question of whether this um, yellow block is the same height as this blue block, it's not obvious. Um, and particularly whether this red one back here, even if it weren't occluded, could we actually reasonably compare it to the yellow one here? We can't because they're at different depths into the scene. Um, so here's a counter proposal. We already know about things like multiple views. We could facet across multiple views. We could you know, group into the same view. So here is that same data. We don't even need to use um, color here to distinguish. And we can just directly look at this data and we can make these high resolution perceptual comparisons where we can see. So that one that I was concerned about in the back here, that was R and D third one over. So this travel one here that's quite short, I have a chance of comparing it and seeing, okay, well, it's a bit longer than this one here in accounting, which was this uh, one up in front. Um, so you can directly make high res comparisons in 2D across the multiple views that you can't make in these rotatable 3D views. One more thing uh, that's not ideal is can you actually read the text? Remember that in visualizations, you're often trying to um, actually read text labels to understand what's going on. Here again, it's quite an early example uh, that's a bit low res um, because people have been trying to be a bit better about this lately. But the reason that this text is hard to read is not just a sort of, this is an old picture. It's something fundamental about the fact that if you are exactly on the image plane, you have pretty nice high resolution text. Um, if you are tilted even a tiny bit, then the huge amount of work that font designers have put into making sure that, like if you actually look at these um, letters on the, my slide, uh, you can read them very easily because font designers have put a great deal of effort into making sure that even with a pretty small number of pixels, uh, you can legibly read the font. As soon as you tilt it even a tiny bit into the image plane, that very carefully designed legibility goes away. Um, if people are curious about it, there's a nice paper that actually talks about exactly what those effects are. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just note that um, once you tilt text even the tiniest of bits, it's much harder to read um, a lot of the things we have um, to make that easier for those who've taken a graphics class, it's things like anti-aliasing uh, and some of those other phenomena are harder to get when you start looking um, at 3D tilted text. So, and let me actually, just because I want to make sure we don't run out of time for the Socrative quiz today, um, let's, 
I'm going to move this and uh, up and we're actually going to do this quiz now for what is happening with this particular 3D pie chart. Uh, here's an example uh, uh, that uh, Anna Kassan recently posted on Twitter as a glorious example of uh, things not to do. Um, and let me grab my Socrative window here, uh, which is let's launch our Socrative quiz. So what, what exactly is the sin that is being, um, there we go. So is the problem with this pie chart occlusion, perspective distortion, or tilted text? We can sort of start critiquing this and we can say, well, this use of shadows is perhaps quite poorly thought out. Um, it's true that in 3D we do, we do use shadows to judge depth. However, inserting shadows into a visualization like this so that you have more changes of uh, categorical color going on is not actually helping the situation. Um, let me make this a bit bigger while we're uh, doing this. So let's see, so far some people have answered. So what we see is that the ability to judge colors is uh, not is impaired by having this, this 3D shadow effect. So that's not a great idea. Um, now, are we actually seeing occlusion, right? This green thing is not blocking the orange thing. The red one's actually not blocking the yellow. So in this case, we're not actually seeing an occlusion problem. So typically, although 3D, chart, 3D pie charts are not a great idea and sticking bar charts on top of 3D pie charts is even a weirder idea, the problem here is not occlusion per se. And now, do we have a problem with tilted text? So let's see how people are doing here. Um, right, so we don't actually, they, they at least had the text directly in the scene aligned with the image plane. So we didn't have a problem of unreadable text. Um, we do have a problem with perspective distortion. Uh, it's hard to understand how tall is this yellow block compared to that green block. It's just harder to make that judgment. Um, so, you know, maybe these two are roughly the same height. Um, maybe they're not, uh, but these things are trickier to say. I see a raised hand over here. Uh, let me grab that back. Uh, you are unmuted. No, you're not. Try that again. Oh, yeah. I, I am now. Um, the question I had here was, is the height of the bar chart like an unnecessary step or does it encode uh, anything? Because it seems like it's just the areas based on the percentages. So does the height, or sorry, do, like do the heights actually have a, a purpose in this context? <laughs> yeah, frankly, the question of what are they even doing in this chart, I believe that the uh, exact uh, debate on Twitter was what is going on here? Um, so what I think, yeah, so the length and depths of the last five bear markets, um, Frankly, I don't know what they're doing here. I can't even tell whether they're trying to redundantly encode this with bar height and angle, or whether they're trying to have two different things. Um, I, it's very hard to, I, I think they might be just redundantly coding the same number, um, but I really can't tell, which is part of the problem <laughs> with this visual encoding. Uh, if anyone has an opinion on what's actually happening here, let's uh, see if anyone in the chat has an opinion. It's saying, um, yeah, so let's see, going through the chat questions in order. What if we can rotate the 3D pie chart? Can the rotating sort of solve the perspective distortion problem? Rotating is a way to resolve occlusion problems. Um, they partially can address perspective distortion in that at least you can have a chance of of changing which one is closest. Uh, it still requires some cognitive load though uh, for remembering things. Um, so the argument of is there occlusion here, someone argued, well, the 3D bars are blocking some areas of the pie chart underneath it. 
it's true that they are blocking it, but it, they are not blocking it in such a way that makes you unable to actually de-encode the information. Um, so they're not blocking your ability to see how wide the angle is. Um, so, so in this case, and this is saying it shows length and depth. The pie chart is length and height is depth, like how much the market dropped. Um, yeah, so I think that is what they're trying to do. So, so they are trying to encode something different in the height of this bar from the angle of the pie chart. But the main lesson we can learn from this, first of all, is <laughs> don't do crazy things like this. Uh, let me actually finish the Socrative quiz. Um, so this is not an effective visual encoding. If this were an exam question, you could now imagine discussing the ways in which this is not. Um, you could imagine some other ways to try to show, say, two different quantitative attributes that did not involve 3D bars on top of a 3D pie chart. Um, any more comments there? Oh, great. Okay, um, so let's talk about some alternatives, right? What, what are some alternatives to using 3D or not using 3D? So here is one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is a paper from uh, Jack Van Wyck and Von Salo. Um, it actually just got a test of time award last year uh, for um, being one of the most influential things 20 years later. Um, and this is a lovely paper that says, what if we do the obvious thing and then think about what's not great about it? So the specific context was there was time series data sets. So there's a bunch of time series data. In this case, we're looking at um, energy usage in a building uh, from over the course of an entire day that's uh, along here in this direction. And then what they've done is they just extrude, so that they, they could have a single time series squiggle, a line chart, and then they extruded this into 3D where they said, okay, we're gonna take every day from January through the end of December for one year and just put these side by side in 3D into the scene. Um, and there's a lot of people that think if 2D is good, then 3D is better. Now, let's think about what is good and what is bad about this view. There are some things you can see in the view. So for example, you can definitely see that late, late at night and early in the morning, there's not that much energy usage in the building. And then at some point, like working hours, people actually show up to work, the building is turned on, they're starting to use energy within the building. So we can definitely get some sense that things start out low, they get high during the day, and then they go back down low again. We can see that from this graph. Um, we can also see some large scale things, like when we look at this color coding, um, we can see, well, it seems like they're using more energy in the winter than in the summer. So maybe that's not surprising if they're heating the building. Um, so we are able to actually see some of this, but let's imagine the question of how much energy did they use at 11.53 a.m. on February 17th and compare that with the amount of energy they used at 3.42 p.m. on October 9th. There is no hope, no hope of making that comparison, right? Because of perspective distortion, that's not, you can't even like directly compare two heights to each other. Because of occlusion, we can't necessarily even actually see in. If there was a lot of usage the previous day, that might block what's going on with in this little um, peak here if it's actually more in a valley. So um, both occlusion and perspective distortion are problems. Perspective distortion is even more of a problem uh, just because of the characteristics of this data set is that it has this sort of peak structure. So at least it's not um, as bad as it could be from occlusion, but it's not good. So what else could we do? What, you know, we can't necessarily just draw this 365 graphs all on top of each other. We know that superimposing them all, that's probably going to be pretty incomprehensible and we're only going to maybe see a couple of outliers. So this comes back to what we talked about last time with aggregation by cluster hierarchies. Uh, they did exactly that approach with this data set. They treated each of these time, they, first of all, they chopped it up into days. So they had 365 separate short time series. Um, so instead of treating it as one very long thing, they chopped it up and they have these 365. And then they tried, they used agglomerative clustering where they did the bottom up thing of saying, well, which of these curves are most similar to which other curves? And they built an entire cluster hierarchy. 
although you can't see it in this interface here, what they've got off screen is the ability to control how many of the clusters they show at once. And so, and what they did here is actually very sneaky. They said, what visualizations does everyone use to think about time? They use calendars. And so what we have on the left is a calendar view where they have color coded each day according to the cluster that it came from. And on the right, they're just showing, in fact, I think it is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're showing the top seven clusters um, which we are able to see pretty clearly, and we can, and they definitely seem to have different patterns from each other, um, and the color coding matches. So we've got linking between these two views through color coding. So we've got a linked coloring of these clusters, and what can we see? Well, hmm. Uh, just to be clear, this is a European style calendar. This paper was from the Netherlands, so it goes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at the top, and then it's Saturday and Sunday at the bottom. So the Saturday and Sundays, this is this very, very low value cluster where basically no one's in the building. Uh, we can tell they're perhaps um, not a computer science department because they didn't have anyone in the building uh, on the weekends, but um, these days RCS department does not have that either. What else can we see? Well, what's this? This tan thing at the top, this seems to be a normal day, right? In the winter at least, and then well, what's going on with these summer days? It looks like, well, in the summer, not quite so many people are around. Okay, that's maybe these maroon days. Um, what else do we have? Well, here's a Friday. Um, the night, here's another uh, Thursday, Friday. So these are some days between, um, like during that holiday week around New Year's or the days between Christmas and New Year's. Many fewer people in the building then. This is not energy use in the building, this is actually the number of people in the building. Um, and then what else do we see? Well, what's this? Fridays in the summer. Ooh, not, not nearly so many people as during normal summer days. So it's even less than it was for normal summer day. Okay, that's Fridays. Um, what's going on here? So few people came in New Year's Day, that got to be a cluster of all its own. There's only one day here, but it's salient enough, the differences, it's different enough from the others that it actually clustered into a single curve cluster. And then there's this one more cluster, which is sort of odd. So it's quite high um, number of people, so it doesn't seem to be a holiday. It's this December 5th, and the only thing that's different about it is people seem to have left early. And if you're Dutch, you know that this is actually Santa Claus Day, which is Santa Claus Day, where you literally, you get to go home one hour early on Santa Claus Day, which is a glorious day and we should have that too. What I want people to be thinking about is, could you have seen this in the other view? There's no hope that you would ever notice something like that in this extruded three-dimensional view. So by doing something more, re more sophisticated, where you don't just take the data that you're given and say, but all I've got left is 3D. You could do this thing where, for example, you derive new data, you have this cluster hierarchy, and then you can think carefully about how to use, for example, multiple views with linking through color, because this is not even interactive, this is static, and yet we're able to see a huge amount of structure in this view. So the careful use of deriving data, uh, thinking about how it is that you could have temporal patterns be easy to see, but also the quantitative attribute of the number of people in the building. Uh, so this is a very nice example of how if your instant thought is, hey, maybe 3D is the way to go, you might think more carefully about alternatives. So the question was, um, but this takes more effort and training to understand, right? Um, yes and no. I don't think that, for example, understanding this view on the right here particularly takes uh, more effort. Um, I think the more training part, perhaps a tiny bit of training just to explain, you know, that this color is linked to that color. On the other hand, you know, some amount of understanding what's going on with these colors, you even in this view, I guess you can read some of them off from the legend. Um, so, it is true that in general, there's often going to be a trade-off between doing maybe the obvious thing and doing the most effective thing. And then that trade-off is going to be about, um, do, are you going to be able to have time to train people up? Um, with a view like this, the training required would be pretty small. Uh, we're, we can definitely be looking at some other examples where there might be considerably more training time 
uh, required than with this one. So, but you're right, it is a trade-off for that. All right, this I think is probably a good place to stop. Um, what's the next one? Yeah, so I think this is a good place to stop for today. Um, and again, we are going to be holding the office hours on Piazza, sorry, the, um, let me just click people through to this. So we will be holding the labs, but the way we're holding them is gonna be Zoom. What has been posted on Piazza is uh, a, under the remote TA office hours, um, we are asking people if they want to book Canvas appointments. Um, we will, so both, so um, first one will be Michael, then Zapung, then Michael. And specifically, there's instructions for booking on Canvas, um, but just to go directly to uh, the Canvas and take a look at how the, if we go to Canvas and we go to the calendar view, um, then what we can see is that already, where are we here? So some people have already signed up for some office hour slots. There's still some open ones. Even if you don't sign up, if nobody's in the Zoom room, then uh, the T's are gonna be happy to talk to you. Um, and if you do have questions and are not able to get into office hours, then send a private piazza on Piazza if you wanna, um, or direct email to me if you wanna meet with me uh, to get advice on the projects. Uh, so far, some of you have talked to me about um, projects, particularly the ones that we recommended talk. Uh, so hopefully more of you will talk to the TAs, um, but definitely if we flagged your project as one where discussion would be helpful, we'd really love to chat with you before you go too far down a path. Um, and uh, so, and you can feel free to sign up for more office hour slots here. So it could be that some people have questions that only take a few minutes, not the whole 15 minute slot. So you are welcome to try uh, and see if the TA is available. All right, with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and I hope that everyone has a healthy and good weekend and that you don't forget to actually take some time to uh, see the world go outside, even if you're not mingling with crowds, to actually get some fresh air. And I will talk to you all next week. Bye-bye.